Right. Good evening, everybody. We're going to start. Um, welcome to Bennington Select Board, Monday, September 8th, 2014. Please join me in this pleasure. Thank you. Take up uh, the first item is the minutes from August 25th, 2014. Um, do we have a motion to accept those minutes? So moved. Motion. Any uh, second. 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 second? Second. Any discussion on those? Okay. All in favor? I'll, I'll abstain. Four in favor and three abstain. There, there Correct? Abstentions. Yeah, three abstentions. Okay. Warrants. Do we have any? Questions, Tom, on the warrants? Uh, well, just informational, maybe I should even know the answer. On page one, uh, Stu, uh, the, it's 307653 Baker Corp for tank rentals. There are three entries, which total $5,500. Um, just maybe reinforce or re-enlighten me to what that is. Those are all a, a tanks that are, that are uh, rented uh, by the wastewater treatment facility. Uh, I'm not entirely sure. Uh, I, I looked at that tonight as well. I'm not entirely sure how they're utilized, but uh, it, it may be an LP uh, gas situation. I can check on that for you. You just get back to yep. me. And the only other question, it's a general. Um, there are quite a few different mowing uh, cost entries throughout the warrants over the uh, mowing yes. season. Um, do we go to bid on those uh, contracts? We do. We bid them every year. Uh, in many cases, uh, the existing contractor will will uh, level fund his or her bid uh, in order to maintain the contract. So it's worked out for us pretty well. And it's not something that we could do in-house? I think I've uh, We don't have the personnel to do it in-house. We used to do it with uh, summer help, uh, but we've been cutting back on the amount of summer help that we utilize for that kind of service. And we rely on the uh, private contractors because the mowing season actually runs from late April into November, late October. Summer help is generally only available during the summer, 13 weeks or so. Thank you. That's all I have. Michael? Yeah, just a question out of envy to the Finlandia sauna. Where is that going? <laughs> <laughs> That's at the rec center. Okay. We actually have a men's and women's sauna at the rec center, and one of them has been down, uh, and so we've got to repair and replace some material. Sharon? Nothing. Okay. James? I'm just on the same uh, topic that, or uh, thing that uh, Baker Court about the uh, the tank rentals. Um, what is the length of uh, time for that rental? What is, what is that eighteen hundred and thirty four dollars, or actually five thousand five hundred and two dollars? What period of time does that cover? My guess is it's annual, but I can't tell you that for sure, Jim. I'll, I'm going to get back to you folks on that one. Justin, no, all set. John, I'm all set. Mine as well. All right. Move on. Uh, citizens, do we have any citizens who'd like to address the board? First, we have town clerk Tim Corcoran. Just for the record, my name's Tim Corcoran. I'm town clerk. I just wanted to address the board on a few items. Um, under a policy that the board had, this would be a year that the outside agencies would be required uh, to petition to be placed on the ballot. And last year, the legislature changed the state law where the petitions used to have to be in for uh, 40 days before the election. Now they have to be in 45 days. And, and if they're short names, uh, they have that time to um, go out and get additional signatures. Same as if a candidate is short names, they have a uh, time to go out and uh, get extra names. And what I was going to ask the board to do was to waive, uh, change the policy and waive the petition process for um, outside agencies that have been already voted by the voters and who are not requesting additional money. And they would still go on the ballot and be voted on, but it would just save the, uh, the petition process and would save our office a tremendous amount of time of having to verify those names. Um, 
because uh, it would, you know, you have as many as eight or ten or twelve of the agencies that would be petitioning, and uh, it's quite a quite a workload to try to understand what the signature actually is, and you know, go, you, you know, we try to do due diligence if we can read the address, then we try to um, <coughs> look them up, and if they've already been voted positively by the voters and they're not asking for uh, additional funds, uh, to me it would be much more simpler um, than uh, having them go through the petition process. And that's, there's about 500 signatures needed. Right yeah, less that than petition. that, probably in the neighborhood of 450 to 450. 460. And the, um, there's always names that are going to be kicked off, people that may live in uh, Parent Acres, although they have a mailing address of North Bennington, they're actually in the town of Shaftesbury. Um, people sign them several times. They forget they signed them or forget which one they've signed. So there's always names that are taken off. And um, so probably I would say 5% of the names that are put in are for some reason rejected. So okay. that's one item. Yep. And I would uh, like an answer on that because I know some agencies are holding off. If they need to do the petition process, they're, they're um, going to get, get going on it. I asked them not to do it a primary day because the statute is pretty clear that there's no solicitation there, and, um, which none of them did. And so if we could get back to them with some kind of an answer. Okay. Tim, you, you still do the uh, <clears throat> review to make sure that they're eligible to be uh, awarded the, the Well, the, the ones that I asked to be waived are ones that have already been approved by the voters and are not asking for right. I, extra money. I understand that, but they, they are still the next period eligible for not-for-profit status. Do you confirm that they, they retain that? Um, no, I don't. I, that's not... Um, uh, my job is clerk to to do that. Um, I think in the campaign, um, the voters could ask that question, but I don't check to see if the homeless shelter has renewed their nonprofit or Bennington Project Independence. Most of them, uh, RSVP, um, uh, the the um, free clinic. Most of them are pretty obvious that they are legitimate nonprofits. Um, I've never had that issue really raised. Okay. Our yeah. policy with that waiving has been that they would pres uh, present their annual paperwork. Well, that. you can make that part That's of right. your, That's that they, they at least um, Submit present them. that uh, information right. so, um, so we get the their board. financials yeah. and, and their annual report and that kind of thing yeah. so, that we, so that we're uh, comfortable with the status and the, the maintenance of the of the organization. We just changed this policy a couple of years a couple back years to reflect ago. what this is now. Right. right, right. I think there's it been was, it's been flexed a little bit. So yeah, and it was I believe it was to, uh, it to, be to do a with three a, year the span. Amount, amount of money, seventy five hundred bucks or more, if I remember. Can right. we get a, Can we get a copy of what the actual policy is now so we can sure. just get a refresher on it? Uh, yeah, I mean, I j very briefly, uh, three years ago, the board adopted a change in policy which said that every third year all agencies must petition. In the past, it's been what, what, what Tim has suggested, which is if you, if you were approved by the voters in the prior year and you're not asking for any more money and it's a max of $7,500, you're on the ballot. You still have to submit an application, three years tax returns, uh, balance sheet, audit if you haven't, are audited. All that information is made available to the board uh, at budget time so you can decide who you wish to interview should you wish to do that. Um, but this is the first time that we've come to the end of that three-year period. It's the first time that all of the agencies will be forced to petition. And seventy-five hundred dollars or more in the last three-year period has been required to, regardless. Uh, correct? That's correct. Well, that's the policy. Um, right. What um, I'm asking for is some of them may have been approved for more than that. I think the free clinic was, and. Um, there's, theirs was, I believe, over $7,500, but they were um, voted uh, fairly substantially that the voters wanted to supply that. Now, it still go before the voters. They would still have to make their case to the public. The only difference would be that um, the petition process is 
is waived for those that have already been approved by the voters. Could, could we have that uh, for us for the next step? Uh, is it 20 second? Oh, to fine. Get back to you, fine. Yeah. Okay. yeah, we're into September and they don't uh, have to be in until mid January. Right. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, I'd like, I think, could get everybody up to speed on what that policy is and who it affects. Fine. Would be, would be fine. All right. Thanks, Tim. The other uh, item I'd like to address is Bennington is one of the few towns um, that has building inspections stricter than what the state has. And what I would like to see the board do is to have a policy that primary residences um, be exempt from our building inspections. Um, if you build a house in Shaftesbury, the state doesn't come in, or if you build one in Pondell, the state doesn't come in. But if you build in Bennington, uh, you have to get a permit, and it has to meet the um, code that the state would set down for, for other types of property. And if I build a house and I want my spindles 18 inches high, I don't think the town should go in uh, through its agent and say, no, they got to be 24. Um, if I want a wooden door in my cellar, I don't think that the town should come in and say, it's got to be a steel door. That's my house. I live in it. It's my residence. And if I'm replacing a porch on my house, it was here uh, a while ago, there was a gentleman on the, uh, on the corner of uh, Putnam and um, Week Street that replaced the porch and uh, he didn't get a permit. Well, why should you have to, if you aren't expanding it, why should you have to get a permit on your own residence? If it's a commercial building, that's one thing. If it's a rental property, that's one thing. But on a private residence, we shouldn't be in there dictating to people how they live in their own home. And um, the state doesn't get involved with it. They let you do what you want, but the town does. And um, uh, I think it's wrong, and the board should abandon primary residences um, uh, from that. Everyone here that owns a house probably thinks their house is safe and, f and uh, it is uh, livable and you don't feel scared in it. But if you ever went to rent that tomorrow, I can tell you your spindles wouldn't be high enough or your windows wouldn't be big enough or there'd be, uh, you wouldn't have enough uh, smoke detectors or they wouldn't be this. And we shouldn't be involved in that in primary residences. And um, we got enough to do in this town um, without uh, wasting our time with people having to get a permit. Uh, if they're building on and doing an addition, that's fine. And on a, a new construction home, there is a state statute about uh, weatherization. Uh, they have to meet a certain code for energy efficiency. That's a state law. But other than that, uh, somebody ought to in, be able to have the type of a door they want, have the type of porch they want, if, um, the, and, and uh, we shouldn't really be wrapped up in that. We're one of the few towns that are, and uh, we should scrap it. So can we get a copy of uh, uh, the, the uh, can we get a copy of uh, the ordinance uh, that Timmy's talking about and review it? Well, actually, we have, we have adopted by reference the uh, I, I can't even remember now whether it's the National Building Code and, and a number of other codes that are nationwide. Bennington has had building permit requirements for single-family residences since 1971. Um, those codes change based on uh, review by uh, committees that are nationwide and they look at all of the changes and you know some of the things that Timmy has mentioned have have created some some difficulties for people uh, railings must be 42 inches high if your porch or your deck is more than 30 inches off the ground well that's relatively new within the last five years but it's nationwide in towns that have building codes. He's right. Shaftesbury doesn't have building codes. Woodford doesn't have building codes. So someone can go into those communities and build a home without getting a permit other than a zoning permit. Uh, Bennington, however, Bennington, Brattleboro, Rutland City, Burlington, Montpelier, all of the major uh, municipalities, I dare say, would have some 
form of building code that they have adopted by reference that the state uses. And uh, I'll beg to differ with you. These towns do not get into primary residences. Um, they've adopted codes, and we will still have codes, uh, but they aren't telling uh, someone in their own home, their own residence, um, uh, what kind of a standard they have to have. Let's pull it up and have a discussion about it at our next meeting. I mean, I've heard this come up in a couple of cases around town as well, and I, I have to agree with it, but without looking at it, I can't have a, a good conversation about the topic. So if we could put it on there as an agenda item and make some decisions next next meeting, I think that'd be good. We should probably be a little more familiar with it. I mean, it, it, it comes into play when you go to do some work on something that's existing, too. It's not just new building, right? I mean, if you... Right. You, right. you put a, a, like I say, replace a porch. Right. Um, uh, you know, it's one thing if you're adding uh, square footage to your property, the listers have got to pick that up. That's one thing. But uh, to replace a deck or a porch or do some of these minor things, um, we're getting pretty, pretty touchy around here of uh, what you got to have and what you haven't got to have, and particularly homes that you live in. And the town has the leverage of not giving a CO and a certificate of occupancy. That's fine if you build your house and you pay cash, but if you need a mortgage, you, you've right. got a, a little bit of a problem there. So it's just something I want to bring up. It's bothered me. I've had a number of people um, come to the office on it, and I can't argue with them. I think that they're right. And if they went into your house or my house or uh, Stewart's house, believe me, you'd come out with a list um, of... Uh, things that needed to be done that uh, uh, really shouldn't have to be. Okay. Tom, we'll use your house as a... Yeah, I was going to say, let's use my hypothetical client because I do have a number of clients that when they go for a mortgage, yeah. um, we, as a matter of uh, compliance, ask for a certification from the, the inspector's uh, office that there are no zoning or issues. And sometimes that requires a, a visit. And uh, on occasion, my clients who think they're living in a safe, quality home. Oh, it's the home. worst, worst yeah. place you could ever have. Yeah. Uh, well, they find out that their yeah. spindles are too low and they have yeah. to replace and them. I don't before. think there's a problem with people falling off porches around this time. <laughs> <laughs> you know. That's because the spindles are higher enough to. Yeah. 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 But I, again, I don't know how uh, our enforcement officer feels. I think that he should be part of the discussion just to find out how serious it is we've discussed it yeah, yeah. i figured you probably <laughs> michael uh i think one consideration i think this is a great idea but very often property and casualty insurance companies that insure our homes look at the way local codes are enforced to get a, a grip a, a grip on rates that they may want to charge so we might want to double check that too as we go forward with this well obviously you know they're they're based on safety concerns in the most part well it's yeah, a matter of safety at what, what mean, line yeah, yeah. yeah. exactly um, would it be safer to drive down Main Street five out five miles an hour right. but does it make sense right yeah. the final thing I had is uh, the board should take a look at and we're getting late in this year of uh, people who are selling farm products and agricultural products um, that um, we have an ordinance on off-premise signs. And uh, whether people are selling eggs or they're selling corn and things like that, there ought to be some type of, I noticed the farmer's market has them, uh, you know, when the market's open and where to go to. And there are some people, you drive over through Cambridge and you'll see if you want corn, take a left, or you'll have tomatoes and things like that. And, um, it's hard if you live on kind of a back road, like a silk road or a veil road, even though for people to find you. And uh, whether it be honey or whatever these uh, products that um, uh, people are trying to sell. And there probably should be a time frame on them. There should be a, uh, uh, maybe an area of, of the size of the, uh, of the sign. But um, we've seen instances where the town uh, has gone down and taken these signs down. And uh, here again, I think we got more to do here uh, with uh, things that are going on and some of the issues that we're facing, worrying about somebody selling uh, squash and, 
and uh, cider and things like that. And um, I think the ordinance uh, should make it possible for those people selling their, their farm products or uh, vegetables that they grow um, to uh, sell them. And, and I don't think that, that hurts anyone. And I think we've been uh, overly strict and with some people enforcing, uh, enforcing that. And uh, I think that we can work with people and encourage them to uh, try to sell their, their products that are grown locally to sell them locally. So that's all I have. And in, in, in that vein, I mean, a lot of those laws are state laws. You know, when you get into the right of way and offsite signage or something, I'm, I'm wondering what we can do. You know, it wouldn't be a bad idea in statewide to be able to have you know one intersection away, two miles. Well, sign I think there's a but, time frame. I mean, yeah. you see farmers market signs up; uh, mm -hmm. those are um, in in within the town uh, uh, right away, and right. I think that's good. It uh, lets people know uh, where they can go and and pick up these things. Who enforces the? If it's a state law, who's enforcing it? Depends on uh, what day it. Oh, state law. State law, the V Trans generally yeah. they're the ones. I don't know if they've yeah. if they've ever come in here and uh, that I know of uh, and done too much on that. They will well, we if they see something. We wouldn't be required to enforce it, correct? If we didn't have an ordinance at a local. No, we have, we have, no, we, we, well, we have laws right. as well, but I mean, but in some cases, it, yeah, yeah, in some cases, um, they they'll be in the state right away. You know, on the state side of a state highway or on a telephone pole or something. But we have like no that. obligation to, to do anything with that. Uh, we do if it's if it's on a telephone pole or something like that. That that's a violation. And off and if it's yeah, our, our our ordinance prohibits off permit signage. Right. Yeah. So if we, you know, we would have to find something that didn't conflict with the state law, you know, like our wrestling sign did, mm -hmm. you know, that type of thing. So you it's could. A perfect example of the state coming in yeah, and telling us. Yeah, and coming in and, you know, the wrong guy drives through town and sees it. I mean, you'll, but, within 30 days, you're going to see all kinds of campaign signs up. Yeah. They're off premise. I think yeah. they're, well, they're. they're all exempt. They're, political yeah. signs. Yeah. yeah, they exempt themselves. Right. Uh, so. But one thing that's not exempt is when they're in town right away. And, um, I think that if the town highway does see that and the state does enforce that, they've already put out a warning mm -hmm. when those signs should be taken down or at least brought back to the candidates or have them take them down. But, uh, uh, you know, trying to uh, uh, promote these farm products and things, granted, there should be some standards, um, but I think we haven't worked that well with some of the people that may want to uh, to do that. And you go out uh, Vail Road, there's a sign there. It's out Chrysler Road, the ladies got honey available. You go over in um, 67 in Shaftesbury, there's a sign there, uh, they, they sell honey. And um, if you're on a road that doesn't get traffic, I don't think there's anything wrong with directing the people um, uh, to that product. I've, I've got a question for you still. Why okay. is the farmer's market allowed to put their sign? We, we, allow, we allow signs for special events uh, to be up for a number of days before the event, but they have to be removed in a certain time frame after. So you'll see signs for Garlic Fest, you'll see signs for the car show. Farmer's market is a continuing process, but uh, their signs are put up and taken down. Uh, so the ordinance, the ordinance does take into consideration those kinds of relatively temporary signs uh, that are placed for a period of time to advertise an event or a, a special uh, sale or something along those lines. Um, I think there ought to be some room for flexibility, especially with, you know, I, I, I can't recall the individual's name that came to me <laughs> and we discussed it several months ago via email, that uh, there ought to be a little bit of flexibility for this guy. I mean, it's only during the summer. And if he were to pick up the signs at the end of the day, what harm is there? Instead of him pasting it to a telephone pole. Or well, I, 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 you know, I'm not going to. No, you don't want to go crazy over. I understand. Right. That. You can I'm just not, not going to argue the, the the worth. I mean, we really are talking about an, a particular individual uh, who who willfully violates, and even though he's been informed of the violation, uh, the ordinance. Um, but 
Uh, you know, we'll, we'll get the sign ordinance out. We'll present it to you folks, perhaps not at the 25th or the 22nd, because that agenda seems to be growing. But some future, future time where you can take a look at the temporary signage. And I mean, I don't disagree with you, Jim. I think if the sign went up in the, in the morning and came down at night, we don't have enough time to deal with that because the notice of violation is a seven-day notice. You know, he's, you know, if I, I can't recall the individual's name, but that's how he, uh, it's a principal way that he's making a living. Well, I think the, well, agricultural, you know, the agricultural industry has a lot of waivers and, and whatnot, I, you know, being a temporary uh, thing to put the investment into, a, you know, a lot of signage and advertising is tough when you're only open a few months. So I think it's part of our heritage and part of what we do here in exactly. the Exactly. So. I mean, I think there's some opportunity there to, to come up with a solution. Yeah. I'd like to see it, frankly, at the state level uh, because you know, every town has not only a farmer's market, but folks that are doing the agricultural pursuits right. and I'd like us to see the our local legislative contingent uh, be involved in the discussion maybe bring it to the state side because we have not the time or frankly the interest to, in, to enforce that type of thing sounds good all right thanks Stuart thank you Tim um, my name is John Hale I'm a local businessman property owner taxpayer you name it uh, I know you're going to be looking at the vacant building ordinance tonight mm -hmm. and there's a lot of factors about I take care of a lot of buildings in town and have over the last few years and purchase them and turn them around and get them back on the grand list and you know start getting taxes paid on them which is what we all want right <laughs> um, I think a few things you need to look at is is police presence um, you know I take care of the old middle school and you know they've done a pretty good job at helping me out I had to come to them and really ask them but we had some issues it's been broken into and you know, it was rated a proper. Uh, when I took care of Catamon Elementary, we were continuously having broken windows and, you know, we just couldn't stay on top of it. So, you know, it's gotta be part of the equation that, you know, they're, they're aware that these buildings are vacant too and, and maybe the owners of them need to secure them a little better to keep the people out of them because they can be dangerous too. Uh, I've been in some vacant buildings that, you know, I wouldn't let my dog walk through because the floors aren't safe or, you know, the basements are caving in and stuff like that, so. Um, but another point is that to promote the use of these vacant buildings, you should be looking at people like Shire Housing to make a, a change to these vacant buildings. I know they have in the past, but you know they're about to build a complex in a middle class neighborhood <clears throat> when there is a beautiful school that they could renovate, tear half of it down, turn the nice part into the same exact con condominiums or, or apartments that they're talking about on Silver Street. And you know, and that, whole realm of affordable housing is a, is a tricky area too. I, I just built 11 apartments at Orchard, it's called Orchard Apartments, it's where the Alexandria Inn is. We're just finishing it this week. We've rented nine of the apartments. Out of those nine apartments, six people have moved to this town for jobs, whether it's at Bennington College, Southern Vermont College, uh, the middle school. Um, I have a person that's interested in an apartment from uh, Mac Molding. So, I mean, there's a viable community of people that want to live in Bennington, but they all told me they can't find a home, whether it's transitional, while they're looking for a house to purchase, or a permanent place to live, a nice apartment in a nice area. I mean, I don't know if you guys have ever driven by it and seen what it looks like. It, it's a beautiful place. It's very nice. It's gorgeous. <laughs> you know, and you know, for that complex up on Silver Street, that's a working class neighborhood for, for middle class working people that want to move to this town. And, you know, it's not being invested on right now. It's, 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 you know, Shire Housing, what they want to do, I just don't think it fits there. They should be looking at vacant homes. It's a great place for the town to give a grant to and help them do that instead of building up a new community in a place that really nobody wants it up there. It's been obvious. A lot of people have complained about it. It's not that they don't want it in the town. They just don't want it in that area because they don't think it's the right place for it. And you guys are the ones that help make that decision, I think. And I don't think you're making the right one. So that's really all I had to say. Mr. Hell, um, this, the vacant building ordinance, go back to that. This is at the beginning kind of something that's been yep, talked I about quite that. a while. Um, would you mind if we contacted you or Mike? No, not at all. Because we're going to be building, there, there's a lot of um, opinions that we're going to want to hear on yeah. where to go with that. No, I'd love to give you my opinion. You know, I've, I've taken care of quite a few in town. Yeah, I know. And we so. purchased them too, you know, we turned right. them around. But, uh, and you know, one of the goals is to get some of these dormant buildings back on the market. And, yep. And, well, you know, the, make I can tell you right home. now that the majority of them are bank owned and right. you know, some banks are really good at it 
it's the big banks like Bank of America, JP Morgan. They're the ones that really don't pay attention to it so much. Mm -hmm. They hire large corporations that, man they, that do pro property preservation. But, you know, there's so many people in the chain that the whole object of taking care of the property gets lost. Where I work with some direct banks, and, you know, we, we go in and I bill the bank directly, and, you know, they're concerned about their properties. And, you know, the smaller banks like the Bank of Bennington or, mm -hmm. or Chittenden Bank or People's United Bank, actually. So, you know, it's the big banks that are the issue, and somebody needs to be knocking on their door, like Kevin or Larry, saying, hey, listen, you know, we got a property in this town that really looks like shambles, and, right. you know. And eventually, you know, in some cities, they turn into crack houses or, you know, somebody's living in it, that, a squatter that shouldn't be. And that's where the police presence comes, too, you know. They need to really know what's vacant and, you know, what they can do to stop people from being in them and stuff. So, but, no, I would love to help you. I mean, I, I've it. had a lot of experience with it, so. Great. Well, thank you very much. Yep, thank Appreciate you. Loyal? Okay. Sure, go ahead. My name's Loyal Westcott. I live in Bennington. And here's some of the laws that I would urge all the viewers and you guys to call our legislators January 2nd and, and ask for these laws to be passed. Every law that I've got here will com combat and close loopholes on our crimes that's happening in our, our community. Now, we just had another girl that was secretly picture taken of her naked in the shower. That's number 22. Now the first law is Jessica's law. What that mandates, 25 years minimum to life in prison. In the event they get out after the 25 years, it mandates they must wear a GPS tracking device and mandate that the criminal has to pay for the system, not the taxpayers and they can't live or work within a thousand feet of a school or a park. We need that. Now, uh, if you read the paper today, Ben L did take one step. They put cameras around the outside of Ben L. But we got that sex offender, which is a category two. That means 50 to 75% chance he's gonna reoffend. You know, Adam Walsh law. Okay, that mandates lifetime registry. Right now, under Vermont law, with Megan's law in place, sometimes their first offense, they don't make them register. Then when they do, on their second offense, make them register, some of them are non-compliant, for one. Number two, 10 years post-release, they're taken out of the system. Now, we're a college town, and we're a tourist town. These tourists aren't going to remember someone that was uh, convicted 10 years ago when it's taken off the website. If we had Adam Walsh law, that mandates lifetime registry so we can keep track of all these rapists. And uh, the third one that pertains to sex offenders is a civil confinement. Now, Governor Peter Shumlin said uh, about four months ago he was in favor of civil confinement because Timothy Zad, they said he is going to reoffend. It's not if, it's when. And he said he was in favor of civil confinement. So if we call the governor and all the legislators and say we need these laws yesterday, 22 kids being sexually assaulted in 14 months, that's way too many. Then we got Watson Law. That pertains to drunk drivers. New York has it. What it states, that when they get a DUI, that they sign a piece of paper that if they seriously injure somebody bad, they can be charged with attempted murder. If they kill someone, they can be charged with murder. We've, we've had two, six accidents from DUI in a two month period last year, all resulting in accidents that were drunk or drugged up. The one family had to move out of their house because Kevin Goodhue had to deem it unsafe to habitate because it destroyed the whole one wall that he went through and hit the second house. Uh, Leander's Law. What that does, New York has it. That mandates that if you get pulled over, drunk driving, with drugs or alcohol, it mandates automatic felony DUI. 
with a child in the car. We need that before we start having people driving with their kids in the car. We need Jonathan's law. What that mandates, it's an automatic felony if you abuse a mentally challenged or disabled person or a senior citizen. It mandates it's an automatic felony, you will do jail time. New York, New York just passed that law a couple years ago because of ODAC place, they end up killing that kid. And that's why they passed it. We need Katie's law or Donna Berry's law. Now, Katie's law mandates all convicted felons must give a DNA sample. New York has it. They've even expanded it to some misdemeanors that are violent crimes. Now, Donna Berry is similar but what it does, it only says certain uh, violent felons. But New York State's finding out, and other states that have this law, that they're finding out that people had committed rapes years ago, weren't being caught, and when they made them give the DNA sample, found out that they did commit the crime, and were able to get more convictions and get them off the streets. I'm looking for Patricia's law and Melissa law. Patricia's law and Melissa law pertains to domestic violence and it pertains to uh, it pertains to the three strikes law. It, it closes the loophole so the prosecutor on your third offense of any violent crime they must enforce the habitual offender law. Right now, there's so many loopholes, it's not being enforced when it needs to be. Them two laws, right there together, closes about holding them without bail, because they are a public safety risk to one person or other people in, the, in society. I'm looking for the RICO Act. That pertains to gangs. What it does. Oil. Correct. Oil. Correct. Oil. Correct. Oil. Correct. These are all things that have to come through the legislature. Yeah, I And we all believe in those things, but you need to speak with your legislators. To right, do that. but I need you and I'm asking the viewers <laughs> and the people that are here to contact our legislators. Loyal, there's a, we talked about this earlier. A lot of these laws, we have elements of them on the books yes. that are in there. And a lot of the elements we don't have are because the legislation and the, the law enforcement industry has found a lot of some of these elements to be very difficult to enforce and, uh, or very difficult to fund. Um, I think you know the spirit is, is all there. And I think we have a lot of the elements. Um, some of these laws are just too expansive to, to, uh, to enforce or to incorporate. And they, you know, they'll very often push people, offenders out of the community and into places where they can't even keep an eye on them. Um, well, that's but, where the GPS tracking device yeah, will come. And we have the GPS in, in, in Vermont. And, you know, um, the, uh, the thing that I really, and we talked about this earlier, was yeah. that I really want, would like to see the, um, as more of a community watch approach to, to what we're doing at the time. In, in, a, in a town, I think that's the direction, really, we need to get into, is where people start communicating with their neighbors. Right, we do need that, yes. That's, but that we need these, the too, because, like the Mills Law pertains to stalkers. We got one that was arrested this year. He not, viol not only violated a restraining order the third time, which made it stalking, he violated the stalking order twice after. But under Vermont law, because we don't have the Mills Law like New York State does, if they deem him mentally incompetent, they don't do nothing with him. He's going to end up killing that woman. These, these laws, if we put them on the books, it closes up the loopholes. Vermont law, if you ever studied it, there's so many variables. Now, Brooks Law, I looked that up about a, two months ago. Brooks Law says 25 years of life their third time. The first and second time, they don't even have to put them in jail. These laws would crack down on all that, and they would have to put them in jail and keep our community safe. We're under siege right now. Well, we appreciate, I mean, I do appreciate your passion for community safety, but unfortunately, you're, you're, there's nothing, I mean, this is a state issue more than it is a town issue. But you're, you live in this community. I'm asking you, and I'm asking the people right. that are watching. Right for these laws and call the legislator. And we've heard it from you numerous times. I mean, there's just not much more that we're willing, I think, to do with it at this point. 
that we're able to do. Yeah, I mean, we communicate with our state level people, and you know, on these things, and I'll. I'll ask you know a few, about a few of those loophole issues also. I appreciate now, it. Now, Senator Dick Sears did say that they're looking at the RICO Act right, right. now. Yeah, and they have a lot of that stuff on their table. Because then so. they can be charged with corruption. It gives them more charges, and so it keeps the gang members in jail longer. Right. Yeah. So you know. Yeah, there's a lot of those things in the works or on the books already. But um, yeah. you know, I don't want to make it sound like we we're in you know a lawless state here and, and you know nobody's ever looked at this there's a lot of the elements of those laws are already on the books and being discussed to, to go further but yeah. I appreciate your attention and I and I think you know information from citizens to the police on what's going on in our neighborhood right. has been the biggest deterrent we've seen we've seen that pay off in the last year and a half um, you know uh, very very visibly so. yeah because I do neighborhood crime watch myself I see a crime I report it yeah, so the, you know, if you, know. If, if you see something, it's your neighborhood, you know, look out for it and, and give a call. You know, and I know Jim's always on Main Street. Yeah. I need him to be more vigilant because I know I've seen stuff and I've reported it. What are you saying? <laughs> because the criminals run up and down Main Street. If you see something, say something. Of course. Yeah, that's right. right. Of course. That's what I'm saying. Okay, of course. I'm just letting you know because eventually guns are going to come out. They've already apprehended a lot of guns already. And I don't want to see a dead body. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you for your time. Thank, Thank you. you. Excuse me. Okay. Yes, Joanne? I'm not really sure how to segue from there, but thank you, Loyal. <laughs> um, Joanne Ehrenhouse from the Chamber of Commerce here in Bennington. And I'm just here because I threatened to come back, so I'm here, and I'm here to tell you about Car Show. So I hope everybody out there will consider coming to Car Show. It's the 12th, 13th, and 14th of September, and Friday is just the swap meet, so entrance is only $5. Uh, Saturday and Sunday, you can come. It's still $8, like it's been for about 20 years, and you can get a three-day pass for $12. Kids 12 and under are free. And we have lots of good things going on. We have the car corral, we have the swap meet, we have all the uh, vintage and antique vehicles, the really popular tractor pull on Saturday and Sunday, and um, kids' activities. We have a great DJ who actually plays the music that the car people and the swap meet people enjoy. And we have several of our Rotary and uh, Lions Clubs and the Vietnam Vets uh, doing the food up under the pavilion and the view from Willow Park up there at the pavilion is absolutely gorgeous. So even if you hate cars, just come up, have a cup of coffee under the pavilion, and enjoy the view of your hometown. Thank you very much. Joanne, <clears throat> if citizens wish to volunteer, how do they get in touch with you or the car show? Because you do um, need a lot of volunteers. Sure, you can call 447-3311. We'll be happy to send you over to the field where most of all of our volunteers will be at Willow Park beginning tomorrow. They'll be setting up, they'll be pounding stakes in the ground to lay out all the vendor spaces. And by the way, we're expecting about 200 vendors, which will e be the equivalent of about 300 vendor spaces. And those are 30 by 10 feet. So we're gonna have a lot of action down there. We'd love to have extra hands. If you can't make it for a car show, but you'd still like to be considered for future events, just call us, give us your name and phone number or email, and we'll put you in the database. Believe me, your efforts will not go unrewarded. You will be called upon. You will get tired, but you'll love it. So, thank any you. other questions? Thank you. No? Okay, thanks thank a lot. Thank you very much. All righty. Our next item here is the area-wide grant opportunity. This is a second review. We have guests coming up here. Um, we spoke about this at the last meeting. Uh, we are looking through our motion to adopt the plan if everybody's satisfied with the information presented. Mr. Colvin. Hi, thank you. Uh, Bill Colvin with the Bennington County Regional Commission. Uh, Dan Monks and I were here two weeks ago. I know uh, some of you were unable to make the meeting. So uh, this evening I'd like to just recap briefly, uh, overview of the area-wide plan grant opportunity. Uh, I'd like to address one other issue. Um, answer any questions, and then we'll ask for a uh, motion to approve uh, BCRC and town staff to work to prepare the grant application and submit by the end of the month. So the project that has been presented is 
um, began when Trish Coppolino from the Agency of Natural Resources and Richard Amore from the Agency of Commerce and Community Development reached out to the town uh, regarding this possible area-wide plan, Vermont Downtown Action Team combined project. Uh, ANR has about $42,000 in EPA funding uh, for this type of work, and what they suggested was they would set aside that $42,000 if the town would apply for a $20,000 municipal planning grant to leverage that uh, money to do this project. So, 62, 42 to $62,000 project, depending upon the uh, successful outcome of the grant. Uh, one interesting component is municipal planning grants require a local match, but given the EPA funding coming into the project, in this case, uh, no local match is required. So this would be up to $62,000 uh, for this project with no local investment required. The project would be a downtown uh, Bennington area-wide plan, which would build upon existing planning efforts that this community has undertaken over the last number of years and result in a comprehensive inventory of real property uh, and existing infrastructure within the downtown uh, area, a market study to evaluate market conditions pertaining to the reuse of key properties within the study area, including a detailed retail leakage analysis to identify where opportunities exist within the community to bring in additional uh, retail providers. It would involve uh, site analyses, uh, looking at opportunities and constraints for key downtown properties, uh, feasibility analyses to evaluate the overall financial uh, and economic feas feasibility of the redevelopment of two to five key properties, depending upon the size of the project ultimately. Marketing plans. I'm sorry, say that last part again. Yeah. Uh, feasibility analyses hmm, uh, okay. for two to five properties, which okay. will be determined based upon whether this is a 42000 or $62,000 project, uh, frankly. Uh, marketing plans, one, kind of looking at the overall downtown um, marketing in general, and then specific marketing plans for the two to five key sites within the community. And all of this would be wrapped up and supported by uh, GIS-backed data and mapping. So that's kind of an overview of what the project uh, would look like. Uh, deadline for the application is September 30th. Uh, award announcements would be in November of this year, and money can begin, uh, could start being spent as early as December of this year. The project would have to be wrapped up by May of 2016, though I think it would be uh, happen much more quickly than that. Um, uh, in the uh, memorandum that we got, is this limited strictly to Brownfields and it's not? Okay. It is not limited to Brownfield properties. Um, the exi potential existence of Brownfield properties within the target area is what's leveraging the $42,000 of investment. So, in fact, all two to, these two to five properties may or may not have any implications um, with regard to Brownfield property. So those two properties that have been donated to the town within the last six months would qualify? They certainly could be eligible. I, you know, a steering committee would be formulated to identify, uh, working with the select board, planning commission, others, community members, to identify where's the biggest bang for the buck with regard to these properties. And I did want to just address, that since the last meeting, um, been approached, a couple of phone calls, a couple of people at the grocery store asking, so how is this planning uh, project different than other plans that have been uh, existing in the community? Are we doing the same thing um, over again? So I just wanted to address that uh, briefly. I think we look at community planning as a pyramid, um, and the, kind of the base of that pyramid are those broad plans like the town plan that identify key principles and tenants. Uh, the things that are really critically important to the community and outline uh, goals with regard to identifying the important elements of the community. And those occur across a broad spectrum. Things like land use, recreation, energy, economic development, housing, transportation. That's what happens kind of at that base level of the pyramid, uh, if you will. Moving up the pyramid and becoming a little more specific are those types of plans like the Bennington Energy Plan, the land use and development regulations, and the recently uh, approved strategic economic development plan, which begin to refine those principles and begin to move them with strategies into, um, into action. That's kind of the mid-level. And I would put this project kind of at the top of the pyramid, where we're looking at very specific, targeted, focused activities. In this case, specifically focused on an area, which will result in very action-oriented um, steps coming out of that 
to redevelopment, redevelop a number of key critical downtown properties, which we can immediately take action on. Planning is a dynamic process. So because we're constantly in this planning cycle doesn't mean that the community isn't acting on prior plans. We're building upon those, we're refining them, we're evaluating them, and we're doing the planning process uh, and the action uh, over. And with regard to that, I would note that in the Strategic Economic Development Plan, this creation of an area-wide plan was one of your top 10 strategic priorities to look at opportunities to redevelop key downtown properties. So we're actually following the plan uh, by moving forward uh, with this opportunity. So with that, I address any questions that are left. And to clarify, this, this is a planning grant, it's not an implementation grant. <coughs> this is correct, There's, this is strictly to create a plan and, and identify uh -huh. uh, targets. And it would so. be limited to uh, town-owned properties or privately owned no. properties as well? Any, could be any properties within the identified target area. Okay. Michael? The uh, marketing material, if you will, for this talks about eight communities where this has already been done and in those eight communities, uh, some of the communities, well, here's what they said. Uh, some, some of these outcomes receive all the following elements, a market study, a, a, a master plan, community branding and marketing plan, and something called strategic organization direction to guide improvement. How many of the eight communities have received all of those and would we receive all of those as deliverables? So the project that's referenced there is the Vermont Downtown Action Team project. It's no. a very yeah. specific um, project coming out of um, Tropical Storm Irene no. for those identified communities. So one consultant came in with that specific work plan to work across those eight communities. All of those elements are eligible for inclusion in this project. Um, there has been some discussion at the local level that perhaps we don't want to go through branding, um, a, a branding study locally again. There's been work in that regard, but it certainly is on the table and if the steering committee working with the select board decides that's important, that could be part of this project. Follow up, uh, <clears throat> the, the documents use the expression strategic organization direction. What's that? It's basically a flowchart of activities that okay. talk about your goals, your strategies into action steps. So, consultant speak for <laughs> yeah, yeah. How tell we're tell me about it. This is called a hybrid project, or is is this a hybrid? Now? This is a hybrid project because it's um, a combination of both of those approaches. Yeah, that's simply our terminology because it's really combining two separate processes: the area-wide planning processes, which is a unique standalone process that the state's employed and the Vermont Downtown Action Team process, which these eight communities have benefited from. So we're kind of melding those together into what would be a hybrid process, taking the best elements of each of those. Okay, and <clears throat> there's no Bennington cash investment required. Is that true? That's correct. Uh, do you have an idea of the person hours and the effort required of staff in Bennington? Um, so to a degree that will depend upon the size of the grant. Um, at the $42,000 level, if, if EPA funds only uh, okay. are inclusive there, um, then those funds will be directed almost exclusively to a consultant um, and somebody at the town would likely be the project manager. If we're successful in the $20,000 20, additional, we get a $62,000 project. Because it would be more expansive, there'd be opportunity for the regional commission to come in as a project manager role, as well as do a lot of that background research using the data that we have access to, that we've utilized in the community, to give to a consultant, which would create significant cost savings for the project and minimize impact on the town staff. Thank you. That's it for me. Thomas? Uh, I'm sorry I wasn't here last time, but I appreciate the, the, uh, the good uh, direction. And I think this is why I find this interesting and attractive, because it seems to be more action-oriented than the, those lower tiers. Uh, they're more planning process. Uh, but I did see that there's, there needs to be a defined committee again uh, to take on the, um, the burden of making sure this grant, if it's successful, uh, is pursued. Can you use the existing infrastructure of committees that already exist under the economic partners or otherwise, so you don't have to redo uh, something that's already been done and visited already? Sure. I think it's wide open for discussion. I think it would be up to town staff and the select board to identify this would be a town project. It would be up to the town to identify who they'd like to utilize for the steering committee. With the economic development strategy, uh, the town decided to use the entire planning commission and brought in uh, additional uh, 
representatives from the community, from the select board to, to supplement that. Um, so there's, it's wide open with regard to a steering committee. Uh, we, as all of these projects, it's important to have a steering committee to provide assistance to the town staff and the project manager and give some guidance to the consultant uh, to result in a successful outcome to create that local tie. I'm just hoping that we don't have to redo and reinvigorate, uh, re, uh, refine another committee because I think the folks in this town are tired of just committee committees. Uh, they'd like to see an action committee, which this one seems to have more flavor of. Uh, so uh, I hope uh, that it's successful. If this was wildly successful and everything went and the way it's planned after everything was implemented, what would be the best case scenario or what your dream to be to have was an outcome of this in the downtown? My dream scenario would be that we would take this plan and begin to solicit developers for critical downtown properties. So I could, you know, not presupposing what those properties are, but you know, in two years from now, if we had uh, shovels turning over at the former Tuttle site or if there was a redevelopment going on at any or all of the Greenberg uh, block, or um, we hadn't identified use for the town garage when that's being vacated, uh, or you know, the armory, um, all of those things would be wide open. So uh, redevelopment, moving towards redevelopment of any of those in the next two to three years, I would think we'd be very successful. Yeah, yeah the concerns I heard uh, kind of line up with what you addressed as well. Um, so I guess my only question was, have we participated in these types of planning projects before that identify market strategies for our town or, or buildings that we should uh, try and redevelop? Have we participated in anything along those lines? Not at this level of detail. I, mean, I think the Better Bennington Corporation um, has, has done the land use and circula uh, circulation analysis, which looks at critical properties. Um, we've done uh, some downtown market studies back in 1999 and 2000 um, where we brought in consultants but I don't think anything has been quite as comprehensive and brought uh, everything together in one place quite like this project and at the size of this project you're able to really bring in I think it's a, a benefit because you're able to bring in larger scale consultants with perhaps a little more regional and national approach familiarity with best practices but you can also ground it in uh, local understanding so I think it really brings together um, you know the best of both worlds. So with what we saw in the market study of 99, 2000, um, what came of that after the study was done? Uh, I think there was some targeted um, engagement, business engagement activities that happened along Main Street. Um, I think in the early and mid 2000s, um, there were some, in Nature's Closet is, a, is an example of when it was on the corner was specifically targeted um, and there was a plan put in place to actually do a rendering of what that space may look like. Um, and in a visit out when somebody was talking at a, um, a sporting goods store, a local rep overheard that, and that's what ended up bringing uh, Nature's Closet to town. So that's an example, but Good. there was a number of specific conversations um, around identified uses for uh, retail that came out of that 21st century initiative. Um, also on that, there's a master plan which resulted, actually the Cavendish master plan, which predates that, resulted in most all of the downtown streetscape improvements that um, this community has enacted over the last 20 years. All of the historic style street lights and uh, pedestrian amenities along all of our uh, significant downtown streets. This community does follow through on the planning efforts that it, that it uh, puts in place. Michael? Oh, I, I, I think this is a, a great idea. I think looking back at the last 14, 15 years, one of the things that strikes me is that Almost every plan that people would have come up with has hit probably five economic cycles in, in the space of that time. We've shortened the economic cycles. We've had a lot of downtime uh, regionally as well as here. So it's, it's, almost, it's almost difficult to think, what, what, could I use, what could I do with the 1999 plan that would still be relevant? Thanks. That's all. Anyone else coming in from Bill? No. All right. Thank you, Bill. Thank you. So, Stewart has a, um, a resolution that's been prepared. If uh, the vote vote, uh, board votes affirmatively, uh, that's available for signing. Okay. So I'll move that we adopt the grant. I'll second that. Second. We have a second. I wave the reading. New to discussion. No. Wave the reading of the. I'm sorry. We, 
-hmm. waive the reading. You have a mo you with, of this. We're talking about the grant. Yeah. So we don't have to read the whole. Thing. So we, we, we need to do one motion at a time, probably on that. Sorry. <laughs> You're right. Point of order. Do you, want to amend, do you want to amend your motion to include waiving the reading of the grant? Sure. Okay. <laughs> do you want I'll to second, second the amended okay. motion. We have a, a second on the floor. We have any discussion on that? Um, just to, to go back on this, what, the things we covered at the last meeting, um, a lot of these planning documents that Bill was talking about uh, were done before they were digitized. So we have a lot of things in paper form that need to be updated um, that are very difficult to update now. Uh, this would also be an opportunity to get them into a much easier uh, format to handle and to update from, from year to year so that we wouldn't have to go through <coughs> major uh, undertakings to, to get them up to speed like LUCA and things like that. So, All right, um, we have a motion. All in favor? Okay, that's unanimous. Thank you, Bill. Five. Number six is the anti-displacement and relocation plan. Yeah, I'm, I'm not clear. Did, what, did he withdraw his motion? <laughs> we just we amended the motion. No, I, we, sure. amended, we, I amended the motion to include the non-reading, okay. the, 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 the waiver of the reading. Yeah, so you don't have to read the whole thing. All right, Mr. Herring. This Good evening. Anti-displacement and relocation plan second review we discussed with some. Thank you yes, for the this substantiation is, uh, and all that, yes. by the way. That was second, second presentation of uh, this uh, federally required document, um, you know, it, it has come up because of the uh, Shires Housing Grant application, but it is simply required to be renewed every 10 years for us uh, to be in compliance for um, applying for federal funding. And so uh, just as a, a matter of course, uh, the state is looking for us to uh, reestablish our anti-displacement and relocation plan, upload it onto the town's website, again, making us eligible for federal funds. Uh, what you have before you is, is pretty standard. Uh, I have talked with uh, the state about the language. It is a standard federal document. Uh, we were able to clarify a couple things in here, which you see, but in talking with uh, their legal Council, they suggested this is is what stand, um, and we went back and forth with uh, just some emails of um, data to support what's on here. So you have all that information with you, and I'll answer any questions. But again, um, looking for your approval on this document. So this document is required for any federal funding. That we it received. is, and I clarified that, and it, it is required. The definitions help a lot. Thank you. And how often do you say this has to be renewed? Ten years, I believe. Okay. But we have a right to amend this as we see fit, right? It's not word for word. Uh, it is, uh, but we have the ability to determine uh, in some cases how it's applied. Uh, but for the most part, essentially what it says is that uh, any type of uh, new construction or redevelopment will not displace those people living uh, in those areas currently uh, without finding uh, alternate housing for them. So essentially we're not throwing people out on the street when we try to redevelop a parcel of land. On, uh the front page here under resolutions, number three, it says, to the extent required under the provisions of 24 CFR section whatever, the, munis the, the municipality will replace on a one-for-one -one basis all occupiable and vacant low-slash-moderate income dwelling units demolished or converted to a use other than low-slash-moderate-income housing units as a direct result of activities assisted with funds under the VCDP. Now, what I take away from that is that the town of Bennington will go into building trades. But we will build this, am I mistaken, so, uh, Stu? No, it basically it what it's saying is that when it, should the town uh, seek to use federal dollars for a particular project, whether we are the lead entity or whether it's like the, the community development projects where the we are the conduit for the funds that no one will be displaced no one will lose their housing uh, in a particular neighborhood regardless of the project and i think some of the examples we used were back during the urban renewal days where uh, with federal dollars uh, some of the cities were going in and, and pulling out 
literally hundreds of, of living units and replacing them with civic centers, highway interchanges, those kinds of things, and not doing anything to, for the people who were already living there. And that's where this particular policy comes from. It arose out of that particular problem that uh, basically said, and this has been around for a number of years now, I can't tell you how long uh, this kind of policy has been in existence, but it's been a very long time. And it's to prohibit communities from displacing uh, residential units with projects that they deem appropriate. But so long as that, that occupant has been able to find new housing and the building is now vacant, we can still change that purpose, correct? In fact, what it would requires is that the, the funder assist the homeowner in finding <coughs> similar housing elsewhere. So once they have found a new lease or whatever, then, they're then able to move along and right. the building's vacant, we can do whatever we deem that's, necessary with the building or property. That's correct, as long as they have moved into to housing that is similar in nature to what they already have. That's basically what they did at Applegate when they did that whole big rehab. They moved people out, rehabbed the buildings, and let them move. They moved them all back in. I mean, right. They, were, they right. were allowed to come back if they wanted to. And, and what I guess I just don't understand is why we have to agree to it. I mean, if this is a stipulation for any federal funds, for any project that's going to displace a population living, why isn't it just simply mandated? Why is it something that we're giving an option to? Yeah, agree to at all. To agree to at all, right. And that's what, that, and that just kind of it seems off. Well, well the, I think the central question is why are we required to? Well, if you say no, you're not going to get the grants. Okay. I mean, that's yeah. basically what is it's similar go. to what, what, you know, Bill's talking about here. If we were trying to con come up with a grant to renovate the town and we put this study together with federal money that said, well, if we knock down this neighborhood, we can put a football stadium in there and, you know, it'll be great. And, you know, and everybody says, oh, that's great. But all of a sudden you've got 75 families or 150 families that have nowhere to go. And this is a They don't have the financial means to... to go buy a house or something like that. And, and you know, yeah, it's a, the it, housing stock that <laughs> right. uh, would so to make sure that you, okay. you don't displace them um, without, you know, uh, considering, a, a, you know, the ramifications. And it's, you know, it, it's federal money. And we it's, adopt and this it, policy with federal money in question. Are, required, are we required to adhere to it for other projects that may not involve federal money? Because, for example, if we, if we adhere to it under the federal money, on a, on a project that did take in federal money, if we have a, a similar project that had zero federal dollars wrapped around it, will the town be required to adhere to it in that standard too because we've adopted it? My understanding is, is no because it simply points out the exact provisions and the act that we're adopting. Uh, I think there's two pieces to point out. One is that by having this policy in place, it also uh, allows us to ensure that any developer that is using the town as the applicant uh, to receive the dollars. We can then require the developer as well to act under these guidelines. Um, the other piece uh, to uh, Justin's comment about, about why we have to adopt it is because it is optional and we could certainly not adopt it. Um, so by adopting it though, that does entitle us to federal funds. And, and again, I don't know how long it's been in place here at the town, but uh, it certainly has been much longer than the past 10 years. Um, so it has been in practice and certainly hasn't hindered uh, our ability to, to function as an entity uh, over the past Well, the, the titles go back to 1974 Correct. in the references. Um, and it, it specifically calls out uh, VCDP funds. So um, most of those have federal money passing through them. If there was a VCDP fund that didn't have federal money, we'd still be obligated to to um, honor this policy. It should, but generally those have federal money attached to them. So is this a, like a cookie cutter template for yes. every municipality yeah. in the state that, that follows this? Yeah, you can go to a website and download it pretty much word for word and, it, and uh, so that it's, you know, the legalese and it holds water basically. So the downside is that if we were not to adopt this, we would no longer be eligible for uh, VCDB or VCDP VCDP grants. grants. grants Correct. Or, or any other federal funding. So it could be federal highway dollars. It could be um, okay. a number of different 
opportunities. <clears throat> and this is specific to low slash moderate income? It is. I mean, this, this specific policy, even though it's tied to all federal dollars, mm -hmm. simply speaks to Assuming low to moderate income units and, again, <laughs> focuses more on the fact that uh, someone is either required to find alternative housing for an individual or at least temporary housing until the redevelopment has occurred and they can move back into the property. I, I mean, you know, is there a number that surrounds that low slash moderate income housing? I know it's below average for the area. Uh, it's um, a it's a percentage of median income. Okay. Um, for that individual or for the area? Uh, it's for the count. It's based on the county average, mm -hmm. uh, and so it's based on an individual, but more so based on um, uh, a two-person household, three-person household, four-person household, and it is a sliding scale. Is there another policy that prevents us from kicking people out that live in? above average housing or can we kick them out whenever we feel like it too <laughs> <laughs> that policy does not exist <laughs> and I, I know i wasn't at the last meeting but i did i did follow along um from what i could later on in the week and catching up and watching it but what brought how did this get put back on the table for uh, as part of the application process for the shires project and i, I should point out that the shires project does not necessarily fall under this policy because it is not displacing anybody. Uh, the, the current property is not in use. Um, but because we're going through the process of the grant, um, the state has said, you know, you're at your 10-year mark. The, um, there's another policy, um, uh, Fair Housing Act, that we'll have to do in the next uh, year or two. Uh, again, it's just as cycles run out, and this happened to be last uh, adopted in 2004. Uh, so we're at the 2014 mark. But if we didn't adopt this, they wouldn't be able to get the funding that they're looking for either. Because, right, that would be... Right. I, I mean, in all honesty, if we didn't apply for any other grant till 2016, then it wouldn't have come up until then. Right. Um, it's just that we are applying for a grant and uh, the current policy is expired. Michael? You talked about the, the average or median incomes being based on Bennington County. <coughs> That's interesting because other parts of Bennington County's median household uh, incomes are larger than town of Bennington. How do we work that? Uh, my understanding is that they are based on, on countywide. Okay. Uh, Thanks. That's the way they do it, like the FHM yeah. mortgages and so stuff. It's interesting the disparity county. in, in yeah. county versus town of Bennington. Thank you. Do you have anything else for Michael? Okay. Any other discussion on that? Questions? <clears throat> They're asking for a motion on that. Uh, if you guys are comfortable, somebody wants to make a motion or? I think that this is open <clears throat> enough to allow us to do what we need to with any project that comes through, and I don't think it's really going to be a hindrance mm -hmm. to anything that we might want to do in the future. Yeah. So. Again, it's been in place for decades. Right. So, and move uh, that we adopt. Okay. We have a motion. Second. Any discussion? Okay. All in favor? That's unanimous. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Okay, signature card coming. <clears throat> okay. okay, now, uh, you're staying up for the vacant I buildings am. ordinance. Okay, let's swing right into that. Uh, in talking with, and you have a memo uh, to relatively the same effect, but talking with the town manager uh, and some uh, other organizations, uh, for example, the BBC and, and others um, that have a vested interest, including some property owners, there's been a long time discussion about uh, the level of, of maintenance or required maintenance on vacant properties in town. Uh, there's been concern and comments even made in this room about the inability to even uh, show properties because of the condition that a particular space is in. Uh, and, uh, and because of the condition of these spaces, they're less likely to either be rented, leased, or uh, purchased. Uh, and I. And also in, in comments, and I've overheard and conversations um, even with other merchants in town that uh, having a vacant, unkept building space or lot next to their uh, place of business that they spend a lot of time to manage and, and keep looking uh, appropriate and open for business uh, is also a deterrent as well. And so our hope simply tonight is to ask that um, the town staff be allowed to research the option of a vacant property ordinance uh, that would look at both uh, how uh, vacant parcels of land are kept as well as uh, vacant commercial buildings 
also uh, vacant uh, individual spaces such as a first floor retail space uh, as well. Um, there are a couple things uh, that we are considering about um, a residential property, not multi-unit, but uh, single family residences. And uh, there are concerns about how certain buildings have been kept uh, for, um, you know, some of it falls under life safety, uh, others do not, and also uh, multi-unit dwellings uh, as well and, and what condition they're kept in. Uh, so our hope tonight is simply to ask that uh, town staff be able to research this, uh, possibly put together a draft uh, ordinance for you to review to see if uh, it meets uh, the level of standard that you think is appropriate. Uh, at the same time, uh, in talking with uh, the BBC, and, and I'll be honest, I, I mean, a lot of this is rooted in um, downtown properties and the ability to get these properties back on uh, the market, uh, back uh, earning income for whoever the property owner is. Uh, um, there, the BBC has also committed to uh, doing outreach to gain input from merchants and property owners within the downtown about their feedback of what should be included in the ordinance as well. So there is broad um, a commitment to explore this uh, and move forward. Tom? Um, I think the concern that I would have, it's nice to have these ordinances, but if they just become other um, depositories on the shelf, uh, it becomes burdensome for the staff. Uh, I, I would like to make it clear that I would expect to have objective standards that can be enforced and that we have the enforcement mechanisms um, and not just calling from a Burlington or a Rutland ordinance something that really makes it would make a difference because I don't think we need another ordinance just for another ordinance. And as John Hale said, there's enough activity out there um, that would need enforcement and we have to have something that has teeth uh, that could provide that. That's good feedback. Yeah. Michael? Uh, you use the expression downtown in, in, in several places in this. Uh, is this only for downtown, or are we talking about? It is not. It's just uh, as our core commercial uh, sector. I used it as an example. No. Yeah. Um, Go ahead, John. When looking at these types <laughs> of properties, uh, if they are run down, a lot, I mean, a lot of the words we're using are encourage, discourage. Um, what if they aren't encouraged? What, what action are we going to be taking? Well, to yeah, I, I, that's a good point, and I can speak a little bit to what conversations we've had. I mean, our hope is the somewhat the carrot and the stick approach that um, certainly as with all our code enforcement that if somebody is uh, uh, in violation that they would go through the same process uh, and uh, go through um, a, a period of remediation uh, and then risk also a penalty, a financial penalty if uh, they aren't maintained uh, and aren't um, uh, brought back into the proper standard. At the same time, I think our hope is to not just focus on the penalty, but also on the incentive. And so if somebody does take care of their property and if someone is certainly marketing it to the best of their ability and, and, they, and it's well maintained and you walk inside and, and um, it's safe for people to enter and, and people can walk in and imagine what their business would look like in this space, um, you know, I think those people, uh, there should be an incentive for that. And I don't know exactly what those would be, but it could be uh, eligibility for our loan program. It could be um, uh, other benefits that would come along with uh, maybe uh, permitting fees and other uh, fees that the town has in place. So I think the hope would be that we would explore not just the penalty side, but also the incentive side for those people who are doing their best to maintain uh, uh, an appropriate looking property. That can be subjective, so that obviously would be the, the core of developing this policy. That yeah. would be the hardest part for the, us as a town. And, and uh, to give an example of, of conversations that we've talked about, uh, things like um, uh, property that's free, free from debris and garbage, free from trash, uh, properties that, um, you know, if, if you've got a, and uh, John, Hale mentioned this, you know, if a property has uh, been vandalized and there's plywood in the windows that there's a certain period of time uh, before that is fixed and the plywood has been removed. Uh, or if the plywood is up, that it, maybe it's painted a certain color. Um, because as we know, there are probably a handful of properties that have had 
plywood up for uh, months and years. Uh, and so uh, I think, again, that my personal opinion is that makes us look like we're closed for business. Uh, and so I think it, it certainly is putting that requirement on there that it can't simply be held in that condition uh, indefinitely, um, that the idea is that the regular maintenance is being taken care of. But I, but I agree, we want to move away from uh, the subjective approach and, and put in very clear measures so it's uh, known right off the bat that either someone is in compliance or not in compliance. And when looking at a primary residence, just thinking about the comments that were made by Mr. Corkin earlier, um, let's say that you know the porch is falling down, just to use his example, um, but it has some historical charm to it that doesn't meet code. Are we going to force them to not only fix their porch, but change the, the actual appearance of it as well? I mean, that has to kind of come into play here. Um, they might like the fact that it looks the way it does, or looks the way it did 200 years ago, and here we are saying, you have to put these one by one square spindles up for feet or whatever. I, to me, it's it's less of um, the conversations we've had uh, because this has been batted around for some time to even see if it was something we wanted to bring forth for us to discuss. Um, but the conversations have been more about, uh, at least in the residential side, uh, trash uh, and uh, other. Um, debris that could be left on a property. Um, it could be the condition of the exterior of the home. Um, you know, an example might be a, a building, uh, and I've talked with Kevin about this, a building uh, that has been condemned, um, but not necessarily torn down. Uh, and so again, um, there's that fine line between is it a safety and, and health concern, uh, or is it simply just <coughs> blight? And so trying to remove the, the blighted pieces of the community um, to the best of our ability. Are there any um, ways that we'd be able to apply not tax burdens on the people that are vacant, but tax incentives for the people that are, aren't vacant or some sort of structure that would uh, encourage people to not just shut their doors because it's cheaper to keep them closed and they're living elsewhere? I mean, would that come into play here once you, you find certain types of solutions or is that the financial penalty that you're, you're talking about? And At this to? point, our, our current um, penalty is a civil penalty. Mm -hmm. uh, I think at that point, if you were talking about um, uh, an additional tax burden, uh, that would be a question for legal counsel, I would assume. Would we be able to do, okay, I guess we'd have to ask about yeah, that. Yeah, that would be part of the process, yeah. If that was able to come back to us, the town, right. it could help fund this type of project and help rehabilitate other buildings or that building. I mean, it could kind of be a revolving door in that respect. I think, it, and I think we've we learned our lesson with probably um, the past ordinances that we've talked about, but I think you know the hope here is to bring it before not just the board but the community as well uh, to let them know that we're exploring this. And most people have seen uh, possibly the the brief article that was in the paper, um, but I think we're certainly open to receiving feedback and input. Um, our our focus has truly and conversations have truly focused around um, extended. Uh, areas of either blight, decay, or complete vacancy. abandonment. For the uh, most you know, part. right. Yeah. And when you're talking about properties that have been vacant for, we're not talking months, but we're talking years and decades. Um, you know, how do we how do we create a system that either supports the redevelopment of those properties, or but certainly discourages uh, the perpetual uh, condition that they remain in? Yeah, I like the idea in theory. Certainly, um, but the devil is going to be in the details. But I think the question that I have for you is, what, if any, exam examples have you looked at um, that uh, you might throw at us? There's what a number of municipalities. Have certainly, adopted? there's a number of cities that have done this. Some are across the country. Um, some that we've looked at uh, are the city of Burlington, uh, the city of Rutland. Uh, the, again, these are are vacant prop. We're talking vacant property maintenance, and so they very clearly identify um, the the condition of the property, free from trash, free from debris. Uh, the you know the grass can't be more than X number of inches, and um, we might think uh, you know I think it's up to us to determine what's the difference between frivolous and and uh, something that is really meant to to help promote. Uh, the community that we live in, and so um, you know, some of the, some of the vacant commercial properties, you know, have have grass and and other uh, landscaping that has overgrown the property uh, outside of 
the containment that they're in. When you talked about incentives, I like that idea as well, and, and calling attention to, you know, good property owners that maintain and do more than just maintain. And I wonder if, if you've seen examples uh, like that in the Burlington ordinance or other ordinances. I, uh, I will say that most of them do not show, uh, at least in the specific ordinance that they've identified, mm -hmm. uh, much language around incentives. Um, so uh, some of them require that on each building and property, the property owner has to have their name, uh, they have to have their contact information uh, posted conspicuously on the property. Uh, so if you're walking by or driving by a piece of property, whether it's a vacant building or a vacant uh, plot of land, you can uh, quickly identify who the owner is, uh, and if you need to contact them, you can contact them. I mean, that that is the, the most high level of the ordinance, and then it gets down into much more detail um, that we've talked about. And I again, I think the, the devil will be in the details. Uh, it'll be focusing on those things that are easy to determine and quantifiable, uh, and, and are less about uh, personal perception uh, or any one person's interest. I know you've been contacted by a lot of people, BBC, realtors, <coughs> things like that, about this issue. So what, what I'd be looking for is the inclusion of those that input through the process and, and whatnot. Our, would, our hope would be that as we explore this, certainly it would come before this board for uh, review multiple times yeah, it's be a before we get to any vote. Um, but certainly throughout that process, I would utilize the chamber, the BBC, uh, maybe the planning commission, even BCIC, to, to reach out to their constituents, to the general public, uh, to make sure we're receiving feedback. I think for most um, responsible property owners, uh, I think they see this as uh, something that can certainly assist with uh, making sure we're putting our, our best face forward when we're talking uh, to developers or we have visitors uh, coming through our community. The, the hope is to build up the community, not make it more difficult uh, for people to do business here. I think okay. this is a great idea. I think it's really worth exploring and I would like to see what you come up with. We need a consensus to ask Mike to go forward. Do we have anyone, any objections? I agree with Sharon. Right. Absolutely. Okay. We, you have a consensus. Thank you, Mike. Thank we'll you very forward much. To see what you come up with. All right. Um, next item is the manager's evaluation policy. We held this off from last week because we were low on some folks. Yeah. Um, bless you. But, um, the last version we had that, that was presented. Um, we could put up for adoption if uh, no one has a, any further changes or objections. Motion. All right, we have a motion. Moved. We have a second from uh, Michael. Motion from Jim. Any discussion? All in favor? All right. Perfect. Thank you. Do we have any updates on the process? Uh, the subcommittee. We, that was that's the policy. Yeah. So did the, you guys get together at all? We did. We did the okay. initial undertaking, Sharon, Michael, and myself. We were really trying to dig into the job description. Um, okay. And that has to be the the first step. Um, we've made made a number of changes, and I, our goal is to meet with um, Stu and Michelle. I know they're going to have a lot of input that would be beneficial for us as well. Review as a group, and then we'll bring it uh, to the uh. board as well for a final review. From there, we'll continue along with. Um, the actual evaluation process, but once we've established a, a new job description, what, what was the what was the date on the last one? Uh, the the job description that we looked at had last been updated in 1995, so we time to time to at least to review it. Need to be mm -hmm. tweaked. So we're still in charge of the telephone booths, right? Right. <laughs> old enough to vote. So okay. we'll be bringing that about soon. I think we're looking at the 17th yeah, or 18th. We hope, to meet, we hope to meet with Stu this week. Okay, so. great. Oh, it's 17th or 18th, I think. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. All right. The next item, um, last week we discussed, um, was asked if we would address the legislature to request the naming of uh, the Bennington Welcome Center as the James Jeffords Welcome Center at Bennington. Um, we have a draft letter. Um, do you want to read that, Sharon, for everyone? Would oh. you be so kind? Well, sure. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Got the <laughs> don't want to read it to me. <laughs> yeah. um, this is addressed to Representative Brian Campion, Mary Morrissey, Tim Corcoran, and Senator Sears regarding the Bennington Welcome Center. We understand that no name that to name state facilities, legislation must be introduced. We ask that you prepare legislation naming the Bennington Welcome Center after Senator 
James M. Jeffords. Senator Jim Jeffords served as a United States Senator for nearly 20 years. Prior to that, he served in the United States House of Representatives for 14 years. Throughout his tenure in Washington, he placed his constituents first and in doing so served Vermont with distinction. He was a principal supporter of Route 279 here in Bennington and was primarily responsible for the 6.5 million earmark, which funded the construction of the Welcome Center, perhaps the last of its kind in Vermont. We believe Senator Jeffords deserves the honor of having the Welcome Center bear his name. It would be small, it would be a small but fitting reminder to all of those who visit the center and to all Bennington residents that this symbol of welcome to Vermont bear the name of one of Vermont's most unique, well-grounded, and iconic citizens, Senator James M. Jeffords. We trust you will agree. Thank you for your consideration. Sincerely, the Bennington Select Board. We have a motion to? I'll move on that. Michael, I'll second it. A second. Any discussion? I don't, I don't know how much this matters, but I just, Representative <laughs> Campions and Representative Corker's <laughs> addresses are flipped here, so. Thank you, Justin. Yeah. Oh, there you go. I just saw that myself. Yeah. Happen to go to one so of those places. We'll, we'll bring it back to you the next time if you agree <laughs> that you want to sign it. Uh, well, we can improve the text of the letter. Yeah. That's, uh, thank you. I uh, guess I'm sort of, it's a, maybe a sidebar, part, not part of the discussion that can be ruled out of order. But I would like to hear a report from someone relative to the early success or not of the Welcome Center. Uh, I don't see a lot of activity up there. It's $6.5 million. I'd like to. Joanne can answer that. She has her hand <laughs> raised. As one would have it, um, I actually checked the statistics today, today from last October when it opened October 11, 2013. Over 53,000 people have gone through the doors. Seems like a reasonable number. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Senator Jeffords. <laughs> <laughs> what was anticipated? How was that number determined? I'm sorry? How was that number determined? Yeah. You're counting. Uh, yeah. And is that in and out? Is that how it's determined? Uh, that should be just in. Clever. What was the anticipated number? Thousand dollars, yeah. thousand people a day. Yeah. So on average, how many is that per day? Well, going into the fall season now, with it already open, we'll, we'll, we should see the and real to numbers. Be honest, it takes a while for people to get used to it. Mm -hmm. um, it is not your typical access uh, welcome center. It's not intuitive. You have to go up a spiral to get to the front door. It's not easy. Mm -hmm. And the people that are going to the front door are not the people that are going to the front door. They're not the people that are going to the front door. They're not the people that are going to the front door. They're not the people that are going to the front door. They're not the people that are going to the front door. They're not the people that are going to the front door. They're not the people that are going to the front door. They're not the people that are going to the front door. They're not the people that are going to the front door. They're not the people that are going to the front door. And it serves the public very well right now because they get a lot of people that come back trying to try second home orders, people who come up skiing, they see the same families, they get a lot of return truckers constantly. So once people are acquainted with it, it will become more utilized. It will never be like a Guilford because we don't have I-91 yeah. and, and, you know, I have a question. Well, Joanne, if we're going to engage Joanne, I need to get you up to the mic just so we're picking. <laughs> Maybe another. We're going time. on. For I, 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 hold on. No, I have. To, I have a couple of questions. Um, with respect to uh, tracking, with um, you know, bringing business into Bennington, which is what was promised, would happen. Have Have there in fact been any restaurant reservations or hotel reservations uh, made we, through the, uh, well, the I certainly visitor center? Anticipate that there have been simply because. Um, as part of the uh, contract with the state, the first kiosk when you come into the Welcome Center is dedicated to the Bennington community. So all the Chamber of Commerce members are allowed to have all their brochures in that front rack absolutely free. Mm -hmm. And there are posters there that this, um, so that you can rent them for, you can have a poster up in that front kiosk for a year mm -hmm. for the cost of $300. Mm -hmm. It's substantially less than the state generally charges. And there are beautiful pictures up there, renderings of um, iconic places around Bennington. Mm -hmm. um, and the staff is extremely 
well-versed and very familiar with Bennington. Um, John Reed, everybody knows John. He, he knows Bennington inside out. PJ DeVito, who ran the welcomes desk down at the chamber, is my operations manager. Mm -hmm. And she runs a great ship there. And I have wonderful people. The staff is incredibly dedicated. Okay. And I'm very grateful to have them. And I think you would all be proud of them if you ever saw them in action. It was maybe, maybe it was my misperception on this, but I thought the visitor center was going to act, and, and for lack of a better phrase, as a sort of a quasi concierge and help uh, people make arrangements to come and visit Bennington. And if that hasn't been done, why not adopt that? Well, we try to serve this this whole state, mm -hmm. but obviously, when people come in and say, "Where can I go for lunch?" we're not going to send them to Burlington. So while we do not hold people captive because we service the entire community, in other words, wherever they want to go, we definitely promote and help people find their way around. Mm -hmm. yeah, thanks. So, and by the way, if you're interested, if you go to their Facebook page, you can take a virtual tour. And we also have an art wall. Every month we change the artist who is showcased and we try to get as many local artists and Vermont artists in there as possible. Um, we have two display cases, which any nonprofit or local business can sign up for on a monthly basis. A wonderful way to showcase local businesses, and several people have taken advantage of it, and hopefully they're doing quite well from it. It looks great right now, actually. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's all, right. all I've got. <laughs> okay. That wraps it up. Anyone else? Any discussion on that? We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Mm -hmm. That is unanimous. Great. I'll, okay. I'll bring back a corrected version. All right. Video. Thanks, Stu. And thanks, Joe and Dick, for that. All right. Next item, the renewal of the Tropical Storm Irene line of credit. Uh, we need a motion to approve, and we can waive the reading of so that. So moved. Second. All right. Um, then, uh, Stu, do you want to give the, the quick uh, yes, explanation of what this is um, for everyone? This basically uh, started out as a $5 million line of credit. We are now down to 1.5 uh, plus a little million dollars. Uh, much of that money is in play with our last appeal to FEMA. And uh, People's United Bank has been very, very uh, patient with us. Uh, as you know, we have 10 years in which to pay off the line of credit before we must go to a formal bond vote. Uh, we think we're going to make it. Uh, we're feeling pretty confident at the present time. And uh, uh, Melissa continues to, to monitor excess funds at the end of the year to make additional payments on these notes as they come uh, due generally uh, in the last part of uh, the fiscal year. In this particular note, you have the uh, line of credit itself. Uh, there is a resolution. And um, the board is also asked to sign uh, the actual document itself. The, uh, tax certificate, line of credit, current expense borrowing. Uh, so there are three places for each member to sign. I've highlighted them with stickers if you show, decide to approve this. All right. Any other discussion? All in favor? That is unanimous. Thank you. Uh, we have a 2014 liquor license application. Yes, and this is a new application. Uh, it's the former Ryan's. Uh, location on Main Street. Uh, this will be Donovan's Inc. Uh, and this too requires just to be circulated for your signatures. Uh, and there are two documents for you to sign. So is this the same owners <coughs> operating it? Uh, it, 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 it can, it's Wayne Ryan, so I'm assuming it is the same owner. Uh, it's the name on the license itself. Uh, so he's coming back into uh, business, I believe. Good. Okay. All right. Thank you. And manager's report. Uh, here, uh, I only have one action item. Uh, the Vermont League of Cities and Towns annual meeting comes up around this time every year. Uh, their business meeting and action on their legislative policy proposals uh, takes place uh, at this time. And uh, each community is allowed to have a delegate to the meeting in the past, well, past 21 years or so. I've been the delegate for the town. Uh, and uh, should you decide that, uh, to reappoint me, um, there's basically 
uh, a motion to do so, and uh, we would then forward the delegate uh, nomination form with the signature of the chair uh, okay. attached. Well, since you so enjoy going to this, I will make the motion that we reappoint you to be the representative for the meeting. We have a motion. Second. And we have a second from Michael. Any discussion on that? All right. All in favor? Easy. Off you go. <coughs> All right. Thank you. And I'll get your signature on this, Greg, at the end. Okay. And that's all I've got for tonight. All right. Other business? John? Nothing, Nothing else from me. Right? Justin? Nothing from me. James? Thomas? Um, I just, I'd like to know what the uh, parameters for the discussion on Monday are. Have you decided or any discussion yeah, on that? I was going to go through that. And I'll defer to you then. Okay. Michael? No. I'm Sharon? No. Okay. Uh, as we announced on uh, this next Monday, which is our normal off Monday, we're going to have a uh, 6 p.m. meeting right here at the third floor of the firehouse. Uh, we'll be discussing the select board's decision to administer the uh, housing grant, or the, the grant for Shire Housing, which they have been awarded, um, and needs to pass through the town. The uh, goal is to have it about 90 minute hearing on this. Um, we're inviting uh, Shire Housing to come in and and present the latest form of the pro format of the project so and be here to answer questions on, on that uh, topic. Um, we're inviting people to come speak on their own behalf. You can mail something to us, care of the uh, town or email to the select board. Uh, we're asking people to try and shoot for about a three minute presentation so everybody gets a chance to, to talk. And um, we're, what we're talking about doing is having a list at the door as you come in. So if you wish to speak, you can sign in. And then I'll have the list of who's next. I can tell you who's next so people don't have to stand up there. If somebody's not comfortable standing, they'll know when their turn is coming up. And, and we can keep things moving without making people uncomfortable. Um, that's pretty much it. It's not a judicial hearing. This is a, a public information hearing. For, and then the, uh, we will make a final vote on that uh, on the agenda for the 22nd, so in a, in a regular open meeting. Uh, um, school's open. Congratulations, everyone entering school. Please be careful driving around schools and things. So you see the activity and school buses are out and uh, all that good stuff. Um, again, tax bills are out. Um, if you anticipate difficulty paying your tax bill on time, please pay a portion of it or whatever you can afford. Um, there are penalties if you're late and they're on whatever's due. So if you can pay it down some, it's to your benefit. Um, I think that's all I've got today. Um, we have a need to go into executive session to discuss contract negotiations. So I need a motion to go into executive session. I'll move. We go into executive session for contract. Justin, we have a second. Any discussion? <coughs> All in favor? Okay. Going in. Thank you, everyone. <coughs>